Thank you for the invitation to speak with you today. I am very honored to be able to represent the Committee on Publication Ethics, or COPE, at this very important forum. I am Dr. Daniel Colt, Chair of COPE and Senior Director for the Journals of the American Chemical Society. I am looking forward to taking this opportunity to talk about COPE and some of the current issues in publication ethics that we are grappling with as an organization and as an industry. Today, I will start by giving a brief background on COPE, followed by an example of a current issue in publication ethics, along with the stakeholders in policing the literature. And finally, finishing with some areas where COPE is working with other groups and organizations to find common solutions to these ethical breaches. COPE began nearly 25 years ago as an informal gathering of medical editors to discuss a growing concern over publication ethics. Since then, it has grown significantly to represent a geographically diverse community of primarily editors, but also publishers and related organizations and individuals covering all academic fields. As you can see, COPE Council has a broad regional distribution that reflects the large international community of research outlets. Our mission is to provide practical resources to educate and support our members, provide leadership and thinking on publication ethics, and offer a neutral professional voice in current debates. COPE is committed to moving the culture of publishing to one where ethical practice becomes a normal part of the publishing ethos. At the hub of our focus are the core practices. The core practices are the policies and practices journals and publishers need to reach the highest standards in publication ethics. They are applicable to all involved in publishing scholarly literature. Journals and publishers should have robust and well-described publicly documented practices for all of these areas for their journals. Within each area of the core practices, we have a variety of resources to meet the needs of our members and the broader publishing community. There are formal guidelines and flowcharts that help in the fair application of best practices, online educational resources like e-learning modules and webinars, and discussion documents which contextualizes current issues to inform and facilitate deeper discussion. One of our most impactful resources are our archive of cases. These are real life instances of complex ethics issues with advice from the broader membership. This is only part of what COPE offers. So feel free to go to the website, publicationethics.org, which is also listed at the bottom of my slides to see more. Misconduct takes on many forms and the complexity of these issues are growing. In addition to concerns around authorship and fabrication, falsification and plagiarism, we have seen a rise in large scale manipulation of the peer review process that includes image manipulation, reviewer fraud and paper mills. While the number of retractions continues to increase, the rate, roughly four of every 10,000 published papers, remains constant. Some experts believe that this rise is a sign that the journals are doing more to police papers, but there are signs that journals and publishers need to do still more. Today, since our time is short, I will focus on one issue in particular that has had broad ramifications across the industry. That is paper mills. Over the last few years, paper mills have received a lot of attention, especially since they usually span multiple journals and multiple publishers. Such large scale manipulations of the peer review process have become more prevalent as pressures to publish become more magnified. Paper mills are entities that manufacture papers and submit them to journals on behalf of researchers for a fee. It is likely that the business, which is definitely for profit, is driven by an academic reward system that is based on producing research output publications in exchange for money and promotions. 
In some cases, there are suggestions that some clinicians and doctors just need a single publication to gain positions in non-research clinics, which allow them to advance their careers. Since research is not part of their professional aspirations, one can see how easy it is to take a more streamlined approach to reach their goal. These papers can be difficult to detect because they resemble real research. Though there are a large number of indicators that may raise a red flag, the actual review of every paper for clear signs of misconduct can be daunting, especially when a publisher or even a single journal may have hundreds of suspicious papers. Associated with these papers are manipulated figures, plagiarized text from non-English language articles, suggested non-existent reviewers, et cetera. Publishers have dedicated significant resources to both reviewing suspicious papers within their portfolios and in participating in broad cross-publisher discussions on how this can be approached more universally. This involves more staff focused on integrity issues and in some cases, staff dedicated to image manipulation. This systematic manipulation of the publication process is particularly vexing. Peer review is a practice that is based on trust. There's an inherent trust that all researchers will behave ethically. So it identifies those that break these norms as outliers. I am not advocating we go to a place of mistrust, but greater transparency and clear processes will shine a light on poor practices and may possibly help identify misconduct earlier in the process. So who's responsible for maintaining the reliability of the scholarly literature? We have funders and institutions that support and finance researchers through grants and employment. This is a monetary contractual relationship where traditionally the outcome of this arrangement is measured in publications. Researchers also have a relationship with journals and publishers where the latter provides a service in the form of validation and curation. Yet there is no clear relationship between the institution funder and the journal publisher. Though both are invested in the quality of the research output, they don't currently have a formal arrangement in which they can cooperate to maintain the integrity of the published literature. As you can see, publication ethics is a community problem, and it sits within the broader arena of research integrity. As the complexity of the issues increase, we as a community, need to work more closely together to help support the application of best practices through engagement and education. With this understanding and realization, COPE is working to expand membership more broadly to include universities as part of the publication ethics ecosystem. Since universities play a critical role in educating researchers and investigating claims of ethical violations, it seems right that COPE acts to facilitate communications between journals and publishers on one hand and universities on the other. We can then work together to institute the highest standards in publication ethics. However, we, meaning COPE, do not have to be the only ones facilitating these conversations. In fact, working together to find solutions works in all of our best interests. Beyond looking to opening COPE membership up to universities, we are participating in a working group looking to develop a stronger partnership between institutions and journals. This working group is made up of research integrity officers from universities and funders, editors and publishers. Together, we are looking to develop best practices in handling ethics cases in a more uniformed manner. It has been very tricky since there has been an understanding and commitment to confidentiality in the peer review process. And universities have a contractual obligation for confidentiality to these same researchers. Though these practices protect the majority of researchers that act ethically, 
it does create a framework where those who flout proper ethical practices can hide. We are working together to find ways in which universities, journals, and publishers can share information to flush out those that are ethically challenged while maintaining the assurance of confidentiality for others. It is a very complex issue, but we are making progress. COPE has also been involved in conversations with the STM Association and NISO. STM, as an industry or trade association, complements COPE on many fronts. While COPE supplies guidance and facilitates discussion, STM has focused on developing and identifying solutions to support publishers in detecting misconduct. In particular, STM has working groups focused on identifying technologies to support the early detection of manipulated figures and potential solutions to identifying duplicate submissions across publishers. These advances will be useful, especially in combating paper mills. With NISO, the strength is in developing industry-wide standards. So with COPE, while we are able to offer best practices, NISO can extend that into standards that can be applied across publishing. In particular, NISO is working on a retraction taxonomy to increase transparency by creating a common language. This activity is with the support of COPE and the publishing industry. Thank you again for this opportunity to talk to you today. I hope this has given you a taste of what COPE is doing and how we are advancing our vision to create a future in which ethical practice and scholarship is the cultural norm. Publications ethics is not a regional issue, but an industry issue. I feel that this is just the first step in an ongoing conversation.